My name is Mike Hedden. I am a, uh, a business owner, a business steward in Gainesville, Georgia. I own two companies. One's called DB Audio and Video. We're a, uh, a commercial contractor. We do audio and video system design and installation pretty much around the southeast. And then uh, Danley Sound Labs is a second company that I started about four or five years ago. It's a manufacturing company. We make loudspeakers. Um, and in four years, we now have uh, been blessed to ship product all over the world. I guess you have to realize that what you're doing is not working, you know. Um, I've been blessed. Uh, Josh McDowell spoke at our church about three or four years ago and, uh, and uh, regarding his book, uh, The Last Christian Generation. Ken Ham from Answers in Genesis wrote a book called um, Already Gone. And by every statistical measurement that you can come up with, what we're doing is not working. So the revolution's got to start. <laughs> it's not an option, it's an essential. And the revolution for me is, or the epiphany for me that started the revolution in my life was when I realized that, that I could actually minister effectively through the business. And the very thing that I used to sort of feel torn from that was, why does my business demand so much time away that I could be at church, you know, do ministry kind of things, that I suddenly came to the realization that, wow, the platform, the very platform that I can minister through, God's blessed me with through, this, through the business. So um, that revolution, in my mind, took place probably, I don't know, seven or eight years ago at least, uh, and it's transformed me. It can be things as simple as, um, well, when you understand that every person that God brings into your life, He's brought them there for a purpose. You know, the Bible says in Ephesians 2 that we're His workmanship created in Christ Jesus, that God prepared beforehand that we would walk in these, in these good works. Um, and that means treating your vendors, treating your suppliers, treating your customers with a Christ-like attitude. And, and, and when you open yourself up to see what God the, the platform, the, uh, the opportunities that God's given you, um, it's stunning the amount. Uh, specifically, we sent out a, um, uh, one of our customers uh, had, a, uh, had an issue. They weren't paying a bill. So we followed up and said, you know, you're usually a good paying customer. What's wrong? Well, we found out that the fellow's uh, main payroll, per, or not payroll, but accounts receivable payable, his bookkeeper, had had a, a, a problem, and it turned out that her, her husband had cancer, and, and so she had a very serious need. And so what we did was we took that opportunity to minister to, the, to that company, and it was really fascinating because the, the, the owner of the company came back and said, I've never had anybody treat me that way. You know, um, it's, um, <laughs> it's, it's having a, a, a vendor come in to, to show you a product and say, and ask the questions of what's different about you guys. You're, you're, something is different about the way you guys behave. And it, and it sets the platform to say, well, let me tell you about him. His name's Christ. You know, we pay our bills on time. We have an impeccable uh, reputation in our, uh, amongst our uh, clientele that, that our word is our bond. And um, I, I give you an example of how ministry happens. Um, now, you have to be realize what is ministry. You know, if your idea of ministry is that every head, every head bow, every eye closed, no one looking, no one getting up, then not only are you going to be sorely disappointed in the business model, you're going to be sorely disappointed in the church model because the vast majority of things that we do at the church is not, you know, we've, we've sort of replaced a little bit of the Catholicism stuff of the Holy Eucharist and the, and the, and the Holy Host being the centerpiece of, of, of church. We've replaced that with the altar call, yet... Nowhere in the New Testament do you see what we call a traditional altar call. I'm not saying that altar calls aren't valid. I'm just saying you got to be careful what you think of as ministry. Well, another example of ministry. God blessed us with, uh, with some unique products uh, from the manufacturing standpoint in this Danley Sound Labs that I actually started as a result of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a, um, a challenge in, in, a, in an organization that I'm in called C12. And that was... What do you have in your life that's destined to fail if God's not in it? Bags, big, hairy, audacious goals. And honestly, I said, I don't have anything, you know? I mean, I'm, I'm kind of doing my thing, and 
we're making payroll and everything's rolling along. <clears throat> and so I just said this really simple little prayer, Lord, if you want me to do something that I'm not doing, just please show me, I'll do it. And lo and behold, um, shortly thereafter, this company called Daily Sound Labs was started. Well, the verse that I felt like the Lord had given me to start it foundationally was, uh, was Proverbs 22, 29. It says, Do you see a man skilled in his labor? He'll stand before kings. He'll not stand before obscure men. Um, and in four years, we now have a stunning amount of, I'm, uh, you know, the last four Cirque du Soleil theaters, uh, IMAX is a customer. Um, uh, we are in the private homes of, in, on Forbes' list of billionaires, in the private homes of probably 10 of the top 15 or 20. Um, and, uh, and the list grows all the time. Well, um, uh, we got a request back uh, last year uh, to go to the University of Alabama. And they just completed a, a massive renovation of their, of their audio system. And I'm thinking, okay, you just spent several million dollars. Why are you asking me over here? Um, but they, what they wanted me to bring them was a product we'd, we've called the Genesis Horn. And the reason why we call it the Genesis Horn is it has some very unique technology. And, and uh, the tag at the end of our promotional brochure says that you will say, as we said in the beginning, this is good, very good. <laughs> and uh, um, so I go to the University of Alabama, set up a demo. I've got all these power brokers from the, from the university system there. And they're all just dumbfounded at how, where did you come up with this product? And... Um, and actually describing it in ways that aren't appropriate for... <laughs> you know? I mean, they were saying things like, how the hell did you come up with this? Where the hell did you, you know? And I just was, I got tickled and I said, fellas, it's not about hell, it's about heaven. And they looked at me like I was crazy. Wouldn't be the first time. And, uh, and, and I said, no, 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 the Bible says every good and perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the Father of light in Him and there's no shadow of turning. And, um, and the neat thing was, they're sitting there listening to this product that they ended up having. They bought it. They installed it. And one of those guys came up to me about a month later and said to me when I was doing a little site visit, he said, you know, Mike, you told me that you thought God gave you a better idea. And I absolutely agree with you. And then that opened up an opportunity for us to talk even further about the Lord. So that's what ministry looks like. It's, it's sharing. It's loving on people. It's giving a cup of water in the prophet's name. It's... it's um, uh, going the extra mile, it's helping that UPS guy. I mean, it's all these things that, that we, we talk about uh, practicing these acts of kindness. Well, that is ministry. Priesthood of the believer is something that is, uh, has been lost, has been uh, de-emphasized to, uh, to, uh, to the detriment of the body. The biblical doctrine of the priesthood of the believer is that all a man needs to have uh, a right relationship with God, the other doctrine is the sufficiency of the soul, is a soul. In other words, I, all I need to get to the holy God when He tore the veil in two is that I can now walk boldly into the throne and find uh, help in time of need is what it says, and I believe in the book of Hebrews. So the priesthood of the believer is, I don't need any other man to go to God for me to have proper relationship. Um, and it has been uh, lost uh, we make much of pulpits. We make much of leaders, not to dismiss, not to to uh, to not to give honor to whom honor is due, um, but um, the the whole reason why God gave us pastors and teachers and evangelists and apostles and whatnot, the fivefold ministry as it talks about in Ephesians four. The whole reason why He gave it to us was was for the body. <laughs> it was always about the body. It was never about the the five. The five exist to see the body equipped. The five exist to see the body minister. And, um, and so here's the responsibility. It's not just about, well, and it's easy to, to, to kind of sound like you're taking a shot at, at the pulpiteers or the people that are on the platform. There's a massive responsibility for the people who come in every week and sit down in the pew, you know? That's the army that God has called. And if you want to see the world come to Christ, you're going to have to see an army of millions of priests showing up Monday through Sunday. Um, it's not the five guys doing the thing, you know, th two or three days a week. And, um, and so if we don't see the priest of the believer brought back to the centerpiece, um, we're never going to see a revival, a revolution.
It's exactly what Martin Luther, I mean, a part of it was when, when Luther came to, the, to his epiphany that he was saved by grace. It was, you know, the man was laying naked on a cold floor trying to show God how humble he was. And he came to the reality that I can never get humble enough to earn God's love. Well, we can never, as, as, um, as followers of Christ, we can never have leadership that is so strong that somehow, vicariously, the goodness of God gets him impugned or brought over to us. We have to go, the Bible says in 2 Timothy, study yourself to be approved, a workman who can accurately handle the Word of God. And that's not the relationship or the responsibility, rather, of my pastor. That's my responsibility. Pastor, evangelist, you know, the fivefold, they were given by God, and that's an important point. They, you know, they were given by God for the equipping of the saints. Their job they are the facilitators of, they are the equippers, they are the trainers, and their purpose is to grow up disciples that then, and honestly, they can't do it because the Bible says, he that began the good work is going to be faithful to complete it, but they help facilitate that. Um, and as they train those folks for the ministry, then they let them go. The whole, pair, the whole sh the focus is supposed to be like you see in the model of Christ. He had His disciples for a short period of time, but the entire focus was, I may have you for three years, but I'm sending you. And, and, and it's kind of silly. The way the church is now, everything comes back. It's, it's very um, introspective. You know, come back to church for this. Come back to church for that. And yet, uh, if, I was, if, if I'm a successful uh, musician, if I'm a successful student of anything, it would be absurd for me to go back to my fourth grade class, you know, that I went to and I lived in, you know, Biloxi, Mississippi, and sit down today and say, man, I just love this teacher. She's awesome. You know, and everybody would say, what's wrong with this guy? You need to grow up. You know, you need to move on. And I think sometimes we need to see the church as being, it's an equipping station. But just as it's, it's illogical for me to say, let me go back to my fourth grade class or my seventh grade class or whatever, it's also illogical for me to expect that I should have to be back every time the doors are open to get equipped. I must not be doing anything if that's all I'm doing. I'm not a very good student if, if I'm not applying it. We have now in smartphones more s biblical scholastical libraries available to us that, and the Bible says to whom much has been given, much is required. It is, it is, um, it's actually chilling to think how God's going to judge us for our lack of biblical knowledge, for our lack of, of, of contextual you know, study. Um, and, um, uh, and so, yeah, I, again, the response, I don't want this to sound like we're trying to demonize the pastorate. It's more, I want to be the guy that he in his, in his uh, perfect day says, I, I, wish I, had an, I, I wish I had an army of these guys. You know, um, you ever met somebody that, that was a dear friend of yours that, that you haven't seen them for years and you, meet, and you see them and immediately there's that friendship and it's like you never dropped a beat and you know that they're still walking the walk? Whether it's a Christian thing or not, I mean, the guy who's the big cut up is still the good cut up and this kind of thing. Um, that's what I think we should see is, you know, training up a child in the way they should go. Well, training up those disciples in the way they should go. If I get that plant going up that trestle right, I come back in 50 years, it's going up the same area. It's not going to grow off somewhere. It's because I've, I've been a faithful steward of what the time that was given to me. Well, you know, um, Casting Crowns did that song, Life Song. You know, may my life song sing for you. Um, and like the analogy of the tuning fork or whatever. Um, I can tell you what ministry is not. I teach a Sunday school class. I play in the church orchestra. You know, I help with uh, small groups for my, uh, accountability groups for my kids. I mean, I'm very, very involved. Um, I enjoy that, but, I, but, but, but if just getting busy is what you equate to being ministry, then you, you've missed it. Um, if you're not hitting that fork, you know? When you're hitting your, when, you know what, this is why I was made, you know? And when, when you, when you um, and so what I would tell the average church member is, 
instead of thinking of God's will, and so many people wonder this and lose sleep over it and wonder, you know, what's God's will in my life? And, and I'm, I'm hoping that I'm not missing God's will and blah, blah, blah. You're living God's will, you know? I mean, Jesus said, take my yoke upon you for my burden is light. And if you're heavy, weary, and heavy laden, He said, come unto me and I'll give you what? More crap to do? I'll give you a nice giant guilt blanket that you can carry around for the rest of your life and feel completely inadequate because you're not doing enough. And when they ask you the 400th time to do something, you say yes because you, we, that's a yoke of bondage. And we have been called to freedom. And that freedom, there's a massive responsibility. So what, what I would tell the body is, A, open your eyes. He's given you the ministry that He's called you to. You just got to be sensitive to it. Um, He's going to call you. He will never give you um, a calling. He'll never uh, call you to do something He's not going to equip you to do. Um, and, um, and start looking for the ministry that's all around you and get your head out of it's Sunday morning, it's Sunday evening. No, it's 24-7. It's and it's also not just that lost member across the street. That's an important thing. But it's also... Um, what about that office mate? You know, do you intentionally go out of your way to, to, to create an atmosphere where, where there can be opportunities for, for ministry? And not just sharing your faith, that's important. But you know, what's the greatest commandment, Jesus said? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and body. And the second is, unlike, is likened to it. And love your neighbor as yourself. You cannot have what's con typically called the Westminster Confession. You cannot have... What has God called us to? He's called us to love Him and, and, and enjoy Him forever, you know? Um, so out of that relationship, out of that adoration that we have for Christ, in our work, in our marriage, in our family relationships, we all come to, to uh, well, it says, whatever you do in word or deed, you do it as unto Him. And, and, and the last thing I'd say to the body is, Get rid of the secular sacred stuff. You, that just needs to be dropped out of your entire you know, uh, vernacular because if you think something secular and se something secular and something sacred, I believe that we live our whole life under the gaze of God's eyes and therefore it's all consecrated unto Him. And therefore, and if you want to say, are you telling me that I can raise my family or love my wife or have a business and it's all uh, sacred? Absolutely. So if you're going to talk about ministry, you have, to handle, you have to fairly quickly establish what is ministry and where does ministry take place. If, if your model is um, one of um, uh, introspective, uh, a building, come back, we have programs, we have staff, uh, we have um, all the things that so many churches do, and that's the way we're going to reach this community for Christ. That's the way we're going to reach this world for Christ. Well, first of all, the facts are, if that is the plan, it's an abysmal failure. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work. It hasn't worked. And all we're seeing is, is the abyss is getting closer and closer, and it's terrifying. Now, it's not terrifying as in, I know that he that began the good work is going to be faithful and completed. I know that we ultimately win. But I don't want to be the person who sits on the watch and sees this whole thing slide off into the abyss while we sat there and celebrated, uh, you know, a brick and mortar. You know, rescue the perishing, care for the dying. You know, um, uh, 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 William Jennings Booth, uh, the, the, the vision that he had that birthed the whole Salvation Army came from this, this, this sea of people that were drowning. And he goes down and starts pulling people in and he's screaming, you know, basically, come on, help me, get these people out of the... And there was nobody to help him, you know. Um, I don't think we understand that. Because if we would, we would say, I don't have time to wait three years to build another building. You know, I've got, we got to go reach the, and then, then you can fall victim to what I think is, well, let's just go grab a bunch of tracks and run around and, you know, throw tracks at everybody. And, 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 and if all I have to do is expose them to the gospel, that's all, that's all that God's called me to do. Problem is, that's not what the Great Commission is. <laughs> he didn't say, Go ye therefore into all nations and just tell them about me. And that's all you got to do. He said, go ye therefore into all nations, baptizing, making them disciples, followers of Christ. 
And, in, and, and again, that responsibility lies with us. So it, I think we have to come to, to an epiphany. We have to come to a reality, a realization that our model is broken. It's going to be a painful process. There are, you know, as the old joke says, just follow the money or the old phrase, follow the money. There are some very entrenched people, many of which will find everything that we're doing is somehow wrong because it's a challenge to the power. It's a challenge to the machine. You know, this machine, this machine that is dead, that if you look at the Southern Baptist, every, I saw this in the Christian Index about two or three months ago, every, with the exception of Alabama, every Southern state's cooperative program was down, in most cases double digits, their, their uh, baptism, professions of faith, everything is sliding down. So what do we do? Just sit there and fiddle while the place is going up? You know, we got to do something. And I think the, 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 the plan is to get out, which means, okay, I don't need to run to, to my local church so much. I need to run out to where the lost are to seek and to save them. And where is that happening the most? It's happening the most in the workplace. I mean, Bill McCartney, um, there have been tons of church uh, leadership people that have said in the last... I heard Johnny Hunt from First Baptist Woodstock say he thought that the next great move of God was coming through the workplace. You know? Well, how is it coming through the workplace? A bunch of priests showing up, doing the thing, you know? Loving, growing, and glowing where you go. Well, how absurd would it be if we like to fish and hunt and whatnot? How absurd would it be for you and I to sit in a boat um, with the latest and greatest everything. We got the latest lures, the latest fishing rods. We got all the equipment. We got the cool uh, giant uh, 250 horse motor. I got the killer, you know, double chargers. I've got uh, uh, um, a, a trolling motor. I've got depth finders. I got everything. And then as the camera pans back, we're sitting in my uh, garage and I'm just talking all day about, boy, don't you love to fish, Jeff? And oh, isn't this great, Jeff? And, and, and all we do is talk about fishing. And we got the latest and greatest doodads. And we built a nice building to put our boat in. And we've got a nice building for our trailer and stuff. But we're not fishing. <laughs> you know, so what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to, if you want to go fishing, here's the number one thing you better know, is what is that fish interested in? You know, are there any fish in that pond? You know, um, and, and what do they want? Because when you want to be, if you want to talk about an attractional model, the attractional model is not making it look like a, some, you know, black box theater. The attractional model is saying, I want to go engage that culture. I'm going to go, I'm going to go as Paul said, become all things to all people. If by chance I can see some of them come to Christ. Um, Paul was finding senses. He was finding those community places. We don't see this in the scripture because we just don't see it in the narrative. I believe Paul was the best tent maker around. I think Paul spent a lot of time building tents because you know what? He built community there. He built relationships there. Um, he had resources there, you know? Um, and, um, um, and he understood that, wow, if I'm going to do what I do as unto the Lord, then that means I've got to be a great tent maker too, you know? Um, it's just we've got to get this mindset out of our, out of our in thinking that Boy, I just wish God would call me to the ministry. Doesn't he, can't he see that I just, I love him so much? Why won't he let me leave this wicked workplace that I'm in and let me go be a, a member of some Christian organization? <laughs> you know, the challenge to the body is grow up. What's wrong with you? You know, aren't you glad that Christ didn't have the same mindset? You know? Man, I've got all of this heaven and stuff. Are you kidding me? I've got to go dwell with those people? Lord, I mean, Father, you understood the plan? Well, yeah, he understood the plan because he was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the earth. Well, one of the things that people are going to ask is, okay, Mike, you sound like you're trying to pitch some, we don't even know what it sounds like. You're talking about a revolution or you're talking about, you know, you're talking about um, tearing down the machine, this kind of thing. Um, what does that look like? Well, you've got to be intentional in ministry. And again, the responsibility lies on those priests. If we're going to make a big deal of the priesthood of the believer, that means there's a lot of responsibility for those priests too. That means we cannot be lazy, you know? Um, so 
part of that intentional ministry plan is we have to say we are going to plan our day in our business day. Part of that is we're going to be intentional in ministry, you know, uh, whether that's a introducing the Bible to people who don't know it, whether that's a Bible study, whether that's a... Um, um, uh, there's all kinds of ways that you can be intentional about the ministry. And um, because if we're not, then what will happen is we'll, we'll just demonize the, the full-time vocational guys and then we'll sit back and we won't get anything done either. You know, so to whom much has been given, again, much has been much is required. So we have to be... Um, it's, it's kind of like, you know, the lepers when they said, why sit here till we die? Maybe if we go back, they'll have mercy on us. And what did they do? They walked into the enemy's camp and the camp had been completely scattered by God. It's, it, the church has got to basically say the same thing. You know, what's the worst can happen? Because I'm serious. What, what's going on right now? If we don't get intentional about doing something different, it ain't going to change. You know, the church that we go to, it's a fine church. Um, we call it a fine church, you know. We have a few hundred people every year get saved. The problem is there's a handful of hundred leaving, you know. Um, so are we bigger than we were? Well, yeah, but here's what you cannot deny. Whatever the size of that church is, it, it, it pales in comparison with the, the population growth in just the community that we live in. So if the plan of God is to see that number of people come to Christ through the local brick and mortar. Oh, yeah. Need to have the D, do not disturb on there. If the plan of God is to see, is to, is to see um, the local church be the only place, the collection agencies, then it's a failure. Because I can take every church in South Hall right now where we live, fill it to capacity, multiple times every Sunday, and we will not even come close to touching this community. So what's the answer? I mean, to me, it's like, it's that whole thing of doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. That's, that's a definition of, of insanity. Well, we are insane sometimes in this church. We've got to wake up and say, we've got to be intentional. Let's do something else. Um, we've got to decentralize the power. That'll cause a few problems, you know. Why? Because I'm not going back to, to that small handful of guys that we call the leadership. I mean, we do have a great, a great high priest. He's not the author of confusion. He is going to lead us and guide us into all truth. And I really do believe that, that if we follow the good shepherd, he said, my sheep know my voice. He's not going to lead us down the wrong road. You know, you know folks are going to wonder why we even did this whole thing with the revolution and, and the whole... <laughs> video um, by anybody's measure we are in really really serious trouble the, the, the church and yet Christ said the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it so so God's not disturbed in heaven our job is to is to come back to our first love um, but it's going to it's going to take a revolution it's going to take each one of us saying hey he's not talking about them he's talking about me he's talking about us you know, um, pray for your pastor, pray for your leadership, love on them, but quit being so dang lazy. <laughs> you know, become a disciple, a follower of Christ, someone who can accurately handle God's Word, someone who, who uh, as the deer pants for the water, so your soul pants for Him. And as that passion flows through you, you'll become attractional. You'll become focused. You'll become intentional. Be the revolution will just be birthed out of you. Because that's what he came to do. He came to, to, to uh, divide. He came to bring a sword. He came to set a family against itself. Why? Because he's mean? No. Because you can't, you can't put this stuff in you and contain it. It has to come out. You know, Jeremiah said it's like fire shut up in your bones. Have you got the fire? Spread it. That's what we need. We need folks... We need, a, we need an army of revolutionaries, and the question is, are you going to come? Are you going to be one of us? Because I don't want to be the guy who sits on the watch that watches the world slide off into the abyss, and we lost it on my watch.